So this is going to be part two of what we've titled Day One. What can God do in a day? Does God predict to do things uh, on a particular day in Scripture? Uh, or are we just always left guessing? We have talked about um, the restoration of all things, uh, the year 5776 that we've entered into today on the Jewish calendar. We've talked about the restoration of the character, the authority, and the power of Christ to usher in his second coming. We've talked about transformation of communities. We've talked about a world that walks by sight and not by faith, and hence the need for blood moons and solar eclipses. We've talked about six uh, phenomenon in the, in the stars above in the last 18 months or coming in the next few days. If, if you start on September the 13th and you go to October 4th, which is the end of the Feast of Trumpets, you have 21 days of significant activity in the heavenlies and on the earth. And isn't that just what Joel said would happen in Joel 2, 28 through 30? That he would show signs and wonders in the heavens above and in the earth beneath, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. He even said that the earth would be turned uh, red into blood. Psalm 19 and 1 says the heavens are declaring the works of God. God is talking to us through the heavens. He's using blood moons to invite us to a wedding feast, into a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. We talked about being on the right side of a blood moon, which is walking with humbly with our God and it being a time of blessing and a time of grace and mercy as opposed to a time of judgment by being on the wrong side of the blood moon. I want to get a little more specific with, with the whole blood moon phenomenon now. Uh, it's, it's interesting that the fourth of these four blood moons called the Tetrad falls on October 28th, which is the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the year on the Jewish calendar. And as a result of that, we have a blood moon and we have a Day of Atonement. And so... We also were talking about entering into a, a year of Jubilee, which only occurs every 50 years uh, on the Jewish calendar. Most folks are only going to ever see one year of Jubilee in their lifetime because of the average age of life expectancy. So it's a big deal to be alive when one happens. And um, we, we have Jubilee and we have these sabbatical rests um, because God is wanting us to say, hey, I'm your source. Work six out of every seven days, and then, and then you yourself rest. Work the land six out of every seven years, but in the seventh year, let the land rest. But because nations have failed to honor God's rest and give the earth a break, the judgment has come, and they've been unable to work, or they've had a financial collapse. And the purpose is, is to get them to start thinking, hey, Something's going on here beyond my control. Wonder who's behind that? What's going on? Is there, is there a, a thing going on beyond my little world? And so it's been said when God wants to get your attention, he touches your money. If he can't get you to slow down, he'll touch your money. Not, not steal it from you or, or destroy it. He doesn't do that. But, you know, you might find yourself with a need that lingers, and God is using that to say, hey, why don't you come apart and talk to me? Your greatest need is not to have that financial need met. Your greatest need is to come talk to me. Because if I just meet that financial need, you're just going to keep on going in the forwardness of your heart, and you're going to miss some things that I've got for you. And so God is saying, hey, slow down. I'm your source. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies, even if they're financial, will be at peace with him. But because man is always filled with self-preservation thoughts, always trying to take care of himself, he works himself into a frenzy. So I want to talk to you about the connection of blood moons that fall on jubilee years, that fall on uh, days of rest and Jewish feasts. In, in 1917, which was a year of Jubilee on the Jewish calendar. A rather remarkable thing took place. 
Uh, let me read this to you. This is... Uh, Jubilee years are important for Jews. The last two Jubilee years have been important in the establishment of the state of Israel. During World War I, Great Britain seized control of Palestine from the Ottoman Empire. Lord Balfour had prayed for many years for the land of Jesus to be returned to the Jews. Following the Great War in 1917, Lord Balfour wrote the Balfour Declaration to Lord Rothschild, which set in motion turning over Palestine to the Jews. The year of the Jubilee saw the foundations laid for the establishment of the State of Israel. However, this did not happen until after the Second World War in May of 1948, Britain formally turned the land of Palestine over to the Jews, thus establishing the State of Israel. After nearly 2,000 years since the Romans kicked the Jews out of their homeland, they once again had their own country. Israel was once again restored to life. But that started in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration. In 1967, the last Jubilee, the State of Israel took possession of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years. Jerusalem is the holy city in which Solomon built the temple that God lived in and Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac. It is also the city where God had his son Jesus sacrificed for mankind's sins. So you can imagine how special the year 2015 is in September when we start a new Jubilee year. It is of special note that this is the 40th Jubilee year since Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. It is the 70th Jubilee year since the first one was proclaimed by God. The number 40 is the biblical time period of redemption the number 70 has the biblical meaning of perfect completion. So this coming Jubilee year will very likely have very special meaning for mankind. Perfect completion of redemption. I'll say that again. Perfect completion of redemption. There have been seven blood moon tetrads since the time of Christ. And I want to talk about them for just a second. In the year 162, 163, there was a tetrad uh, of blood moons that occurred. And in the year 162, 163 was the greatest persecution of Jews and Christians in the history of mankind up to that point. And it was done by Rome. In the year 795 to 796, Rome and Islam battled for dominance. If you go back in your history books, you'll find Rome and Islam in tremendous war in that year. Also a blood tetrad. In 842 to 843, the Vatican was attacked by African Islamic invasion. In 860 to 861, Islam was unable to advance into Europe because of Charlemagne. In 1493 to 1494, the Jews were expelled from Spain by the Roman Catholic Church and the birth of the new Western world, which was to be a home for the Jewish people. In 1949 and 1950, we experienced the rebirth of Israel and the freedom from the Arabs. In 1967 to 1968, there was a six-day war in which the Jews got victory over their Arab enemies. What three 
things are all in common with all seven of these blood te- red blood moon tetrads in these years. Who are the three main players in all seven of these that have occurred since the time of Christ? Rome, Israel, and Arabs. What is taking place right now as we speak in the news? The Pope, Islam, and Israel. And it just happens to be during the four blood moons completion in this year and in this time and in this season. I don't find these things to be coincidental. Not only that, but we're talking about this occurring during a jubilee year, a year of rest, a year of rest, redemption, a year of restoration, the day of atonement. Uh, look at Leviticus chapter 25. In Leviticus 25, God commands his people to not plant the fields on the seventh year. This is to be a year of Sabbath rest so that they can honor God and rest the land and rest themselves. During this year, every seven years, all debts are to be forgiven. Uh, Slaves are set free. The land is to rest. The economy of the land will be reduced. Shemitah years can bring down economies, kingdoms, or nations that do not follow God's will. If the people follow God's laws, the nation is blessed for that time. If not, it can mean bad times for a nation. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn's book, The Mystery of the Shemitah, explains the many unique important events that have happened in American history on Shemitah years. If you're in covenant with God and you don't honor his rest, then you get judged. America, in 1917, was a Christian nation in practice and not just theory. Hence, in 1917, a Shemitah year, also a Jubilee year, they rise to power at the end of World War I. There was also the rising of the communist state of the Soviet Union. It was also the year of the defeat of Germany, the fall of the Tsar of Russia, the fall of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, the fall of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. In another Shemitah year, In 1938, the German Nazis attacked Jewish businesses and burned Jewish synagogues. In 1945, another Shemitah year, Nazi Germany is defeated. The atomic bomb is dropped on Japan, thus ending World War II. Japan signs a peace treaty the same week at the end of the Shemitah year. In 1945, the United States becomes a military superpower. The U.S. dollar becomes the world standard for currency. The United States is the richest country in the world and the world's largest lender nation because we are a Christian nation. In 1962, they removed prayer from school and they legalized abortion. So in 1973, another Shemitah year, the United States Supreme Court declares that Americans, I said 62, it's 73, declares that Americans can kill their unborn babies. In 1973, the World Trade Center is completed, which is a symbol of America's economic strength. In 1973, America loses its first war to Vietnam. Nixon takes America off the gold standard, thus sets in motion the decline of the U.S. dollar. Seven years later, in 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court bans the posting of the Ten Commandments in public schools, Thus, God is now completely banned from our public schools in America. In 2001, the World Trade Center buildings that were symbols of America's economic strength are destroyed by an Islamic terrorist attack. One week later, Wall Street has one of its greatest collapses on the last day of the Jewish Shemitah year. In 2008, exactly seven years later, Wall Street suffers its largest decline, America is now the world's largest debtor nation. In 2014 and 2015, we start a new Shemitah year. And this happens in connection with the tetrad of four blood moons, which all occur on Jewish feast days. 
As the United States has turned away from God and endorsed many sins, it is very possible that God's judgment will fall in America during this year of the Shemitah. I want to talk about some things here as we go forward and as we're looking at all of this because I want you to see that in 1945, America is the world's largest lender nation and the richest country in the earth. In 28 years, well, let's say this. In 2008, so if you go from 45 to 2008, 55, 63 years. In 63 years, nine sets of sevens, they are the largest debtor nation. In 63 years, a nation goes from the richest nation to the most indebted nation. In 63 years. That is not a long period of time. God does not play when he comes to his rest. You will either honor him as the rest or you will be on the wrong side of that and suffer the consequences. And, and you know, I, th this seems to have no bearing whatsoever on the moment right now, but maybe it does because who knows who will hear this as we go forward and even now. There is another form of rest that God prescribes besides just your time, and it's the tithe. For all intents and purposes, the tithe is a shemitah, is a system of rest. It simply says, I am not my source. God is my source. And he can do more with 90% than I can do with 100%. And so, whereas there's this, a judgment for those who won't physically rest one out of every seven days, there is a judgment for those who won't tithe once a week or however they get paid. If it's once a month, if it's bi-weekly, whatever it is, there is a judgment for that. Jesus says through the prophet Malachi in Malachi 3, 10 through 12, that if you will bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there can be meat in his house, then these are the blessings that will follow. Open windows, a rebuked devourer, a, 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 a source of income that flourishes, uh, people looking in on you saying you're blessed, so it's a testimony. And yet, if, if the tithe is not brought in, then the exact opposite is what takes place. A closed heaven, stuff always being devoured, a source of income that doesn't produce, even if it does produce, it's blown away when it gets home. And people looking in questioning what you're doing and how you're doing it. There, there is black and there is white with God. And so when we won't rest, the money dries up. When we won't tithe, the money dries up. And so why should I be paying attention to a blood moon? Why should I be wondering what that means? Because it's affecting your time and it's affecting your money, whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not. And it is God saying, hey, rest and tithe and enter into my blood covenant with my son Jesus. Do things my way. I'm the source. You're not the source. That's humility to tithe. That's humility to take a day off. And if we won't, then we suffer the consequences. And the very thing that we were doing to try to get ahead, which is preserved by working extra or using the tithe to pay a bill or something, it blows up in our face and worse than what would have happened had we, it, 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 it discombobulates, it reverses, it becomes a curse instead of a blessing. And so um, these things are significant. These things all tie in together. And so I, I want you to take note of something, that because these blood moons are occurring on the Feast of Israel, um, the Day of Atonement, the, the, the Passover and these types of things, there is a, this last one that's coming, uh, the 28th, 
um, we're looking at uh, a celebration. We're looking at a time uh, of atoning, a time of purification, a time when, when we are now officially really, really right with God. We are right with God through Christ. We don't always act right. So we come before the Lord in 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we have a clear consciousness between us and God. We are ready to harvest. We are ready to act without hindrance, without a weight, without a, a struggle, without stress, because it is good. It is well with my soul if I have done it correct and if I have done it right. Well, if you're the devil and you know that that's potentially coming for those that will participate, it behooves you to discombobulate and confuse and, and try to distract before that time comes. So some would suggest that there is a higher level of spiritual activity in the months leading up to all of this. And so this would explain why May, June, July, going into August, September, October, there are increased spiritual assault and attacks. Because right on the other side of it is peace and harmony and atonement and all is well and all is right with God. And for those that, that are right with him, he has these eight specific blessings that he's pouring out. And we just want to refresh real quickly um, these, these four blessings. And so let's, let's just jump back in for just a second and look at what is potentially possible for us who are actually um, walking uprightly with him and, and will not be judged with non-believers or the, uh, the, the unobedient, the, un, the non-compliant. If you go to Joel 2.23 through Joel 2 and verse 30, you'll see eight specific blessings promised, or, or promised to people excuse me, Joel 2, 23 through 32, you'll see eight specific blessings promised to the obedient ones, to the people who have rightly divided the word and who have rightly observed atonement, who have rightly received jubilee, who are, who, who are honoring God in these time of blood moons and that, that coincide with a feast that won't happen for another 500 years like this, if it goes 500 years. Joel 2, 23 there is a double portion blessing, double portion blessing for those who will be compliant. And, you know, be, while we're here, uh, I think it's, well, how do I get compliant? Because maybe we're not making that clear enough. Let, let's, let's do this. Let's get, let's get compliant. What does the Bible say uh, we, can, we can do to be compliant with the Day of Atonement? How can we draw attention to obedience during this time? Well, in Leviticus, or excuse me, in Exodus, let me dig something out for you right here. Go to Leviticus 16. And Let's go to Leviticus 16, and I believe it's verse 31, because I want to highlight compliance with this. It's not just, okay, I believe the blood moons is God speaking. Well, it's one thing to believe that. It's another thing to act accordingly.
and hold on, I want I'm trying to pull something specific out for you. I'm sorry, I didn't I said Leviticus 16 and 11. It's actually Leviticus 23 and verse 27. Leviticus 23 and verse 27. The tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. Be careful to celebrate this day. You must observe it as an official day for holy assembly, a day to deny yourselves and present special gifts to the Lord. So what we're encouraging people to do is to honor this time with a time of fasting and praying and a time of gift giving unto the Lord. Uh, I, I've got a shirt on. You know, I, I've had these things just popping up, gifts and surprises. You know, it's, it's, you can get in a ditch and say, well, we're going back under the Old Testament law by talking about all this stuff. Well, we're not. But there's types and shadows, you know, and there's, there's ways that um, God does things. And God does not divorce himself from the nation of Israel just because they've not received him as their Messiah yet. Um, he still speaks to them in ways that they can understand. And so what, what I have done is I have taken this time and I have chosen to sow special financial seeds and gifts of my time and gifts of my abilities in different directions um, as a way of saying to the Lord, Lord, obviously Jesus is my day of atonement and I can have a day of atonement every day of the year if I want one because of Jesus, the atonement living in my heart. Um, however, since the roots of my faith are Jewish roots, they are celebrating this time with fasting and gifts unto you. The Holy Priest is in there doing the very same thing. I'm a priest unto you. I want to just honor you for the way you've done things and the way you're doing things in this earth. And I want to sow seed unto you. And so I have had several opportunities um, in the last few days to, to, to do this. And it has begun to come back to me in waves, glory, because you, you cannot give God. So when we're talking about how do I qualify for these blessings, this special season, this special time that you're talking about here in Joel, for those that are compliant, um, how do I get in on this? Well, humility, repentance, fasting, praying, and gift giving, which are good for any day of the year. But when you know the Holy Ghost is working some things, there's an emphasis, there's a sovereignty, a divineness to it, you want to get in on it. You want to jump in on it. And uh, so that's my encouragement to you, is to take this to heart and to say, Lord, is there something you'd like me to do in repentance, in humility, in praying, in fasting, in gift giving, in, to increase a compliance with this special season that you've set before us that won't come around again for 500 more years? And see what he has to say. And then just whatever he says, do. And so um, in Joel 2.23, it says, Be glad then, children of Zion, and rejoice in Jehovah your God, for he giveth you the former rain in just measure, and he causes to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That's this month. That's the double portion. The double portion rain blessing is this month. Now, we, we are on a Gregorian calendar, which is different than the Jewish calendar. Uh, so to us, today is uh, the middle of the month. It's, it's, it's September the 14th. However, um, if you can come off of that for a minute, 
and recognize that today is the first day of the year on the Jewish calendar. Uh, and it's the first day, so it's the first month. It's our ninth month, but it's actually the Jewish calendar's first month. Uh, then this will register with you a little bit more. You know, I, I, it's September. It's not. It's not January, but you know, God's the one that set their calendar in motion. God's the one that told Nehemiah how to order things, and so I think there's something to it. I don't want to get in a ditch about it but I believe there's something to it. So I don't think I'm outside of the realm of possibility to say, hey, Lord, you know, I've got Jewish roots. My Savior was Jewish. You want to pour out double portion this month? Have at it. Let's have it. Then the next one is financial overflow. Joel 2.24. And the floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. Does God want to pour out an extra special financial blessing for me this month? I believe so. I believe I'm compliant. I believe I'm doing what he's told me to do. I might not be doing it perfectly, but I believe um, I'm headed in the direction I need to be headed in. And so does he want to do that? I think he does. And so we receive that. I mean, I guess if you don't want it, you don't have to have it. But if you want to tap into it, I believe he does. And so just as we speak, we're releasing that upon folk. In Joel 2.25, there is a restoration of that which has been lost. It says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Now God didn't send it, the devil did, but God allowed it because they allowed it because of their disobedience. But now they're in compliance. And he said, okay, I'm going to restore what was lost. The greatest, you know, when I was first coming up here to this area, the most consistent, greatest financial contributor in, 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 in other ways uh, sent me an email the other day uh, reconnecting. I just don't think that's coincidental at all. You know, when there was a disconnection and now there's a reconnection. And um, then I had a person that had, um, I, I probably would best say it, listened to a demonic voice uh, that I had, to, I had to step away from. And I got a, you know, a, a connection uh, from them recently uh, where they want to be a blessing again. Then I got a t I got a guy got text this morning from some folk that were you know negatively affecting my life you know. Then I got uh, I mean I could just go I I, I don't want to get too specific because I you know we're, we're we're guarding and protecting, but I can't even I, I would I would have to stop and think at how many different situations and scenarios have occurred in the last little while that fall along the line of restoration of things and people that have been lost. This is the season for it. A lost voice, a lost influence, a lost relationship, a lost opportunity, lost hope. Anything lost can be restored if it was God's intention to give it to you originally. And this is your moment, this is your season to seize it. I had, I've had several people that have come here that had maybe severed in some way recently reconnect to reach out. Several, several. Uh, it's, it's an amazing time. So if we're seeing that, why wouldn't we also see the double portion? Why wouldn't we also see the financial overflow? The next one is Joel 2.26. And some would believe that though we don't know the day or the hour, of the Lord's return, not even Jesus himself does, only the Father does, we can know the season. Because of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's jump over there real quickly and look at that. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We've talked about it a lot. Might as well um, read it, <laughs> if you will. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says this. 
verse 1. But as to the suitable times and the precise seasons and dates, brethren, you have no necessity for anything being written to you. And then he goes on to talk about the return of the Lord. So Paul is saying to a group of people, on the heels of Jesus saying to the early church in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it is not for you to know the, the, the times and the seasons that the Father has set, to Paul saying, hey, you don't need anybody to tell you about the times and seasons because you already know. Somehow, in our thinking, there's a disconnect that we're maybe not supposed to know. But the Lord is saying, I have no problem, and rather I encourage you to be in the know on the season and the time of my return. And, you know, we, in our natural understanding, have four seasons, and they each last three months. God says a day with him is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Well, does God think a season is, is three months long? Well, I don't know. But I know that he meets us where we are. And I know that the season of atonement is September, is August, September, and October. I know the season, you know, there's three times that people appear before the Lord in the Jewish faith for, you know, a right relationship with him. And one of those is in the spring, which is Passover. One is in June in the summer, which is Pentecost. And the other is now which is atonement. And so which of those three seasons would you say Jesus is most likely to return in if we're going to look at it that way? Well, there's a lot of people that believe it's the season of atonement. You know, you might can make the case for Passover, but, uh, you know, passing over judgment and rapturing us out. Uh, but some would say that it's this season because it's the season of, of sins are atoned for, and that's why you get anywhere with God. That's why you get passed over, is because you're right with God. And so there are some who believe that, if, that, that there is the very real possibility, not that the world would end, but that the church would be raptured in this season, even to September the 28th. There are people that say that is possible. It's possible for it to happen today. You know, but Jesus says we don't know the day or the hour, but we can know the season. And so every year when this season rolls around, it, you know, it's possible that maybe this is the season that we get raptured in. If we don't get raptured, then this is what takes place. And it is one of the, it's the fifth blessing or the fourth blessing. And it's in Joel 2.26. And it says, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Jehovah your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. So there's an, either a rapture or an explosion of miracles that we can expect to take place in our lives as this season approaches. And so, uh, and it's based on this word wondrously, signs, wonders, and miracles. There is nothing wrong with expecting God to pour out wondrous miracles and signs and wonders among us, even this very day. Just allow the Holy Ghost to have his way. Then, number five of these eight specific blessings promised to the obedient ones, the ones that are right with God at this time, is uh, the, an increase of Jesus' presence, and that's Joel 2.27. It says, and you shall know that knowing is different than wondering. Knowing is different than hoping and, and, and believing. Knowing is different. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am Jehovah, your God, and there is none else, and my people shall never be put to shame. So a presence of God that makes a difference, that differentiates between knowing and wondering, between you and you, and, you're, and the one that doesn't know God. You can expect that this time of year. Seize hold of that, an increase of Jesus' presence. Number six, increased revelation knowledge based on Joel 2, 28. 
And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. So an outpouring of the spirit, dreams, visions, and prophecy sounds like an increase in revelation knowledge to me. You have a right to expect that this time of year. You have a right to expect it every day. We're just giving greater emphasis to it right now because of the season that we're in on this Jewish calendar. Number seven, angels will camp around your children. And I, again, I committed to do this camp on the 19th on the reservation long before I was aware of any of this. That was just something in my spirit that the Spirit of God spoke. And it's based on Joel 2.28 where it says that his spirit's poured out upon your sons and your daughters, your servants and your handmaids. Jill 2.28 and Jill 2.29. Angels camping around your children. Camp for children. <laughs> Angelic. Um, now listen, I want to say this. I can't even stress this enough, okay? Uh, if you're on the right side of this, this is what you can expect. But what happens if you're on the wrong side of this? The exact opposite. When I got to the reservation on Friday, after my phone call with Hollywood, what do you think happened? There was somebody um, on the reservation who was stabbed to death. And we prayed with, the two, the, with that man's two daughters to be born again over a year ago. So they have a heavenly father, but now their earthly father was murdered. He was stabbed. Well, um, one of our members lives in the same apartment building that the stabbing took place in. And they spent some time explaining to me how their kids actually saw the fight that took place that led to this person's death. And the police actually interviewed their kids. Say, hey, if I'm blind, walk me through what you saw. And these little kids had to explain what they saw. Now, they didn't see the actual stabbing, but they saw the, the person in the altercation. Then they saw, they left, then they came back, and they saw that, that person they thought was asleep on the bed. Was not asleep on the bed. <laughs> okay, he was dead. And they asked, would I come pray over their apartment complex? which we'd already done once for them personally. Now this is for, you know, something else over there. Last night in service, um, someone um, who was supposed to come to service uh, had a grandchild go missing. Hours before that, I spent an hour with a mom who was with, uh, staying with a family, and there was an eight-year-old that took off walking down the road with a five pound baby. Taught I gonna kill this person, gonna do this, gonna do that. All three witnesses in the realm of the children because they're on the wrong side of this season. I'm gonna go you one better. I want you to look at this picture. Now this, this took place in service. This is not the first time this has happened. Uh, but you know, here is someone taking pictures during the service that we had a Saturday afternoon. This was daycare, child care <laughs> during the service. If you can see that, I just scooped that boy up in my arms. And there's a and I preached. It's either that or let him continue to be a distraction. And the Lord used it to be a blessing to that child, and we got to speak a blessing over it. And it was it was great. And then the scripture says Jesus took the children up one by one, laid hands on them, and invoked a blessing upon them. Even when his disciples were trying to get him to not, they, they were being distraction. He said, No, let me have them. If you don't come like a little child, you can't get in. And then I'd had a prophecy spoken over me years ago that I was God's little boy. And so I'm just having a moment right there. 
because we're on the right side. We're in church, we're in service, we're doing it. So if you're on the right side, it's a blessing. Angel of God. And then in the scripture, sometimes the word for angel is also the word for pastor, <laughs> for revelation. So the angel of God camping around about the kids. The pastor camp, pastors creating a kid's camp. That's a part of that fulfillment. We just got a basketball goal donated. What do you think we're going to do with that? Camp. Kids camp. Fun stuff. Number eight, Joel chapter two, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of Jehovah shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those that escape as Job has said, and among the remnant, those whom Jehovah will call. So there's deliverances from all stoppages and blockages. What are, what are stoppages and blockages? Well, distraction, unforgiveness, hard hearts, dissension, rebellion, pride, the flesh, the world, the devil, envy. This is a season when you can expect to be delivered from all that would oppose or stop God working in your life, in you, through you, and to you. Have you been muffled? Let's take, we're taking that muffle off. Have you been hindered? We're removing the hindrance. It is a wash of the blood of Jesus. It is a flood of the Spirit of Christ this time, this season. I hope you're getting excited. I know I am. I'm preaching myself happy. So we'll go ahead and wrap this up with that. I just wanted to teach a little while on this season, on this time. And I want to end it with this. If you go to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 23, we read a prophecy that Daniel gives concerning the Messiah in the last days. And... It's worth mentioning that in this specific prophecy, God gives a specific day that he will do something. This is not the only example that we could give where God does something like this, but it is a, a really great example. An angel says, at the beginning of your prayers, Daniel, I was come forth to tell you about the vision and to give you understanding of this thing that you saw. He says, 70 weeks of years or 490 years are decreed upon your people and your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish and put an end to transgression, to seal up, make full the measure of sin, to purge away and make expiation and reconciliation for sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to anoint a holy of holies. Know therefore that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, until the coming of the anointed one, a prince shall be seven weeks of years and 62 weeks of years. It shall be built again with square and moat, but in troublous times. And at the end of 62 weeks of years, the anointed one shall be cut off or killed and have nothing and no one belonging to and defending him. At the end of 69 weeks, or 69 years, six, or 69 sets of sevens, the, the Messiah will be anointed, he will come into Jerusalem, and he will be cut off and killed with no one supporting him. And that's, that clock, that, that, that 490 years, starts ticking from the day that a commandment is given to rebuild the temple. I want to read you something. <clears throat> in four forty five BC, uh, Atraxerxes gives to Nehemiah the commandment to restore the temple. This is based on Daniel 9.25. From that day, 
there are 483 biblical years that go by, or 173,880 days. So, when you take into account the Jewish calendar, all these various ways they configure things, it means that 173,880 days from the day that he gave the command to rebuild the temple, the Messiah would come into the city of Jerusalem and be cut off and killed. Well, that's exactly what happened. On Palm Sunday, 32 AD, Jesus gets on the donkey and goes into the temple, or, or goes into Jerusalem, and is cut off and killed. If you know, if you go to Jesus' own words, all right, I want you to see something that we we just. I mean, you can take blood moon seriously or not, but if you go to Luke nineteen and verse forty four. I want you to see what Jesus said about specific times and days. He's looking at Jerusalem, and he says, They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the day of your salvation. Or the time of your visitation. If you had been a person in the know in biblical prophecy and biblical scripture based on Daniel, you would have known that Nehemiah began to rebuild the temple 178,003 whatever how many hundred days and that on the 330th day 100 in 78,330 days from the time Nehemiah began to rebuild the temple, that the Messiah was going to come walking into your town. And who but Jesus had ever done the things and said the things that he had done and said? You would have been standing there with a palm branch in your hand on April 6th, AD 32, saying, this is the guy. This is the Messiah if we knew nothing else but Daniel's prophecy, this is the guy. So does God tell us the day and the hour that Jesus will return? No. But he did tell him the day and the hour that he would be there the first time. He told him in Daniel. But he did say we would know his season. So the, the context of this radio interview, and this, this is why I want to wrap this up, is if you had eight days to live, and you knew it. You knew you only had eight days to live. What would you do differently? Or would you continue to do what you're doing? Explain that. My part is to explain the blood moon phenomenon, which is the reason why a lot of people think they only have eight days to go from September the 22nd. And of course, we're going to debunk that. But the fact is, is that for somebody, they only got eight days. Somebody's going to die on that day. And even if it ain't eight days, somebody's only got nine days, somebody's only got ten days, all of us ain't got but one life, one life to live. Ain't none of us living past 120, however you get around it. None of us. So it's the last of the last days for all of us, one way or the other, however you look at it. And I hear you got a God in heaven saying, look at what I'm, it's no trouble for him, but look at what I'm going to. Look at what extents, what, look at what links I'm going to to tell you I'm coming and I'm coming any minute. Don't be on the wrong side of it. This is not Noah building an ark in a forest where very few people on the earth know about it. This is God in the heavens yelling in love to mankind. Be ready. Come to my wedding feast covenant with my son Jesus you, you cannot miss the blood moon you can't look up and go I don't see that and a person that looks up and sees that has got to wonder he's got to pause and say why you're there with information 
revelation knowledge to say to that person, let me tell you what's the backstory. Let me tell you what the Bible says is behind that. So today we've given you more than enough information to be able to tell the guy on the street, the person in the next cubicle, the guy on the phone, the person you're going to see whenever, hey, are you ready? Don't be on the wrong side of the blood moon. Let me tell you about this wonderful covenant you could enter into that the blood moon just signifies, hey, good job. And don't be the one where the blood moon is signifying, you're on the wrong side. So let's pray. Lord, we pray that we would not be eggheads with just a head full of knowledge, but, but doing nothing with it, but that we would be givers of this revelation knowledge. Not just receivers, but we would be givers. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And Father, we pray for divine opportunities, open doors of utterances to share with our family, our friends, our loved ones, anybody around us, what is going on in the heavenlies. The glory of God is coming forth and how they can be on the right side of the way things are falling out, particularly as it pertains to the blood moon phenomenon. Lord, we pray that folks would go back and listen to these broadcasts over and over to gather the information, to gather the knowledge. We would continue to do it in such a way that um, brings blessing and increase to the body of Christ, to the world, that we win souls with this. That's the ultimate goal. That's the price that Jesus paid, is to win souls. We pray, Father, for more research, more understanding of what we're dealing with and looking at here to be better vessels, to be better voices for you. We bind the devil from distracting in any way, shape, or form. We pray that you would bring healing to this land. This day of atonement would be healing for America and not judgment. This jubilee year would be a year of release for each of us that are walking with you and those that will. We claim this done by faith. We ask you, Lord, to deliver us from wicked and unreasonable people. We thank you for complete pardon of our sins and of our iniquities. We thank you for delivering us from greed and self-reliance and, and, and independence of you, but that we would recognize that, Lord, you're our source, that you are the greater one, that you meet all of our need, not us, but you meet all of our need, according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that as we delight ourselves in you, you give to us the desires of our heart. And Father, that you are the Lord, our shepherd, our pastor. We shall not want for anything in Jesus' name.